Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we're really excited about having Dr. Walcott here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Claire Eagle. I'm the interim assistant director here at Historic New Harmony. We are a unified program of the University of Southern Indiana and the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites. Following a successful uh, year of virtual programming last year, um, we decided to follow it up with another series. Uh, this one, of course, focused on Robert Owen for the 250th anniversary of his birth. A few housekeeping things. Please keep yourself muted while uh, Dr. Walcott gives her presentation. If you have questions or comments that you'd like to share, if you put those in the chat, I'll make sure they get to her at the end um, during the question and answers portion. Um, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, we'll be posted to our Historic New Harmony playlist on the USI YouTube channel in the next few days. So if you're having um, any internet issues or have to leave early for any reason, uh, you will be able to finish. Uh, Dr. Uh, Victoria Walcott is a professor of history at the University of Buffalo, SUNY. She has published two books, Remaking Respectability, African-American Women in Innerwear Detroit, and Race, Riots, and Roller Coasters, The Struggle Over Segregated Recreation in America. Her new book, Living in the Future, The Utopian Strain and the Long Civil Rights Movement, will be published by the University of Chicago Press in spring of next year. In addition, she's published articles in the Journal of American History, the Radical History Review, and the Journal of Women's History, among others. We're very excited that she's joined us tonight. And without further ado, I will pass it over to her. Thank you so much for that. I'm just going to share my screen here. Just give me one second. OK. OK, can you all see that? OK, great. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Historic New Harmony, and I want to thank the University of Southern Indiana for the invitation to uh, do this presentation with you guys today. Uh, particularly big thanks to Claire Eagle for handling all the logistics so effectively and for helping um, me make this all come together. So I'm very excited to talk about this new work with you, and I'm very happy also to answer questions, so I'll make sure to leave time in order to do that. So today I'm going to share some work out of my new book, and I'll talk a little bit about, about the book at the end of the uh, presentation, too, to give you a little bit more insight into what that covers. But I actually, you can see here my, my title slide, I have the idealized image of New Harmony and also an image of a Black cooperative in the mid 20th century. Um, and I'm actually going to try to connect these two things together today. Okay, whoops, hold on one second. Okay, uh, I want to start off with these two quotes, uh, one from Robert Owen, I know that society may be formed so as to exist without crime, without poverty, with health greatly improved, with little or any misery, and with intelligence and happiness increased a hundredfold, and no obstacle whatsoever intervenes at this moment except ignorance to prevent such a state of society from becoming universal. Uh, many of you are familiar with Robert Owen. That's why we are all gathered here today. You're less familiar, perhaps, with some of the advocates of cooperatives and the followers of Robert Owen in the African-American community. So the second quote here is from a Black educator and social scientist from the mid-20th century who was an you know, avid proponent of cooperatives. And he says that individuals, this is his idealized vision of the future, individuals will be born in cooperative health centers, will live in cooperative houses, will meet their needs from cooperative stores, will be protected by cooperative law, and in the end will be buried in cooperative burial uh, asso associations. So you can see that these two quotes kind of have a similar idealized vision, not of cooperation as something narrow, opening up a cooperative grocery store, for example, but as something broader, something um, even perhaps utopian that bring them together, a comprehensive and idealistic vision of the future. So again, that's what I'm trying to do here in terms of both the book and also with this talk um, to bring those two things together. I should also say that in the title of the talk, I use the term the long civil rights movement. So those of you who are historians might be familiar with this term, but just for briefly for people who are less familiar with the historiography of civil rights, more recently, historians have moved away from thinking about the movement as something that starts in 1955 with the Montgomery, Montgomery bus boycott 
and then ends in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act, they sort of expanded the idea of the movement to incorporate certainly the labor movement of the 1930s, and that I'll be going into a little bit of that today, all the way into the Black power and Black nationalist movements of the 1970s. So it's a much more broader and kind of comprehensive uh, view of the long civil rights movement, which is relevant for what we're going to be talking about. So I want to talk just briefly um, about Robert Owen's relationship to slavery and abolitionism and some of the earlier utopian communities. And I, I realize I'm talking to some people in this audience who uh, are, have deep knowledge of this. So I'm treading, I'll tread lightly in terms of um, what I'll be presenting. But as some of you might know, Robert Owen's legacy in terms of slavery is somewhat mixed. Uh, his new Lanark mill in Scotland obviously is using cotton from plantations worked by enslaved Africans in the Caribbean. He also traveled through the Caribbean and saw plantation slavery firsthand. Uh, on his way to New Harmony and did not in, indeed speak out broadly um, against the system of, of, of plantation slavery, although he would have identified as being supportive of abolitionism. Um, now, and significantly his son or one of his sons, I should say, and more than one, Robert Dale Owen became actually a quite prominent abolitionist in the 19th century, particularly when he was elected to Congress and also advocated for the Freedmen's Bureau uh, after the Civil War was over with emancipation to help free people, formerly enslaved Africans, to have better rights within the United States. So that brings us to a couple of utopian communities or antebellum abolitionist utopias that have a sort of direct connection here um, with New Harmony uh, and, and with Robert Owen. Um, and one that you might be familiar with is Neshoba, Tennessee. This was founded by one of the followers of Robert Owen and a close friend and associate of Robert Dale Owen, Frances Wright, who was also born in Scotland. Uh, and she visited New Harmony. She actually first visited when it was still a Rapite colony, utopian community, visited in 1825 and actually returned later. Um, and she was influenced certainly by the ideas of cooperation, the ideals of Robert Owen. And she went on to found in 19, 1826, excuse me, a utopian community in Ashoba, Tennessee, which specifically was designed to try to lead enslaved people into a state of independence and a state of freedom. This is 1826. Uh, this was in, again, in Tennessee. She actually purchased slaves. She, she purchased enslaved people um, and put them to work uh, clearing land and starting to develop the community. She goes off to Europe on a fundraising trip by the time that she returns a couple of years later, the community is in disarray. Uh, and she actually ends up taking the remaining residents, the, the enslaved residents of Neshoba, and actually brought them to Haiti to allow them to have freedom and independence in Haiti. So that's one example of a somewhat failed, but important kind of uh, utopian community coming of, out of the Owenite ideas. Another one you might be less familiar with is from my own state of New York. Um, and this is associated with John Brown, of course, the great abolitionist and sort of abolitionist warrior of the 19th century, uh, a real estate developer and quite wealthy man, Jarrett Smith, uh, in, this, in New York State, founded this community, which John Brown referred to as Timbuktu, and he actually bought, John Brown bought a farm uh, right adjacent to this. And this was designed specifically to allow um, African Americans in the state of New York to have access to property ownership so they could vote because you had to have a certain amount of money, I believe it was $250 of real estate in order to have access to the vote in the 1840s uh, in New York state. So he divided up 120,000 acres of land in the Adirondacks, um, gave it away to free blacks in the state to allow them again to have access to the vote. And although there were sort of private ownership of the land for that, they also worked the land communally and followed cooperative uh, principles. This lasted to about 1855, as in so many of these communities, the agricultural labor was quite arduous, um, so it did not survive a very long time. But it's another example of a kind of abolitionist attempt at utopia coming out of New Harmony and, and the Owenite ideals. There's other ones of these as well. There's the Northampton Association of Education and Industry in Western Massachusetts. Uh, that was founded in the 1840s as well. And, and so Journer Truth, the great black woman abolitionist spent time in that utopian community. 
But in all these cases, these are all founded by white reformers, right, for enslaved people or newly freed people um, during the antebellum period. So I, I actually want to turn now towards um, some communities in the postbellum period before I get to the 20th century, uh, where they're designed and founded by and run by African Americans themselves. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit more whoops, um, about cooperatives. Okay. So, and the importance of cooperatives for the Black community. Um, and here, the Rochdale idea of the Rochdale cooperatives, the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers is really key. Um, so this was a movement in, in uh, the Rochdale cooperative system that was designed in 1844 by a group of weavers in England who were followers of Robert Owen, read his work um, and designed this cooperative system around his ideals. So there's a direct connection between the Rochdale Society of Pioneers um, and the Owenites and, and Robert Owen's teaching. So this group up, drew up a set of principles, which is really key. You can see this sort of more modern version of the set of principles uh, on this slide that can be easily replicated and copied and has been easily replicated and copied really globally. Um, and this Rochdale pioneers and the Rochdale cooperative principles remain absolutely central to cooperative work in the United States as well as elsewhere up until the present day. Dr. So, Walcott? Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, I don't believe your slideshow is changing. Okay. I still see the antebellum utopias. Yeah, let me, okay, let me uh, just go back up here. Just give me one second. Oh, you're fine. I just wanted to make sure you, there we go. <laughs> is that there? Okay. I think yep. I paused it by accident. Okay. You're I will good. try not to do that again. Um, actually, let's see if I can go back. No, it doesn't want me to do that. Okay. Okay, so you can see the slide with the Rochdale Pioneers now? Awesome. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to try to, okay. So then to move on, uh, I want to talk just a little bit again about these all black communities, cooperative societies that are founded by African Americans themselves. Um, and again, following the notions of the Rochdale cooperatives. And, and again, the workers in America founded the first American cooperatives based on Rochdale's rules in 1863, and they proliferated in the post-emancipation period, obviously the civil wars over in 1865 throughout the United States, but were particularly popular actually in the South. Mount Bayou, Mississippi is a particularly significant um, cooperative experiment and all black town in the post-emancipation period. It has its roots in a really sort of interesting uh, experiment known as Davis Bend or the Davis Bend Plantation. So here, Joseph E. Davis, who was the brother of Jefferson Davis, who as you may know, was the presidency, president of the Confederacy uh, during the Civil War years, but Joseph Davis, more idealistically, was actually a follower of Robert Owen um, and something of an Owenite himself. And he tried to create his plantation in Davis Bend to follow cooperative principles and to follow some Owenite ideals, even though he did not in fact free the enslaved people um, in that community. During the war, the Union Army occupied Davis Bend. And then when the war was over, uh, Joseph Davis, actually gave the plantation or he sold the plantation at a relatively uh, good rate to the enslaved um, individual, Benjamin Montgomery, who had been really running the plantation uh, for and to create an all black community in Davis Bend. After a certain amount of time, partly because of droughts and floods, um, but also because of attacks by neighboring white supremacists, this is in Mississippi, of course, that community begins to fail. And so they moved to Mount Bayou, Mississippi, and they set up an all black town in Mount Bayou, which becomes really quite prosperous. They have a post office, a church, they have banks, stores, schools. It's a railroad depot. So they have some access to a market economy that's fairly significant. And this is all being run on the cooperative principles. And interestingly, in 1952, Medgar Evers, who's, as you may know, the NAACP secretary in Mississippi, moves to uh, Mount Bayou, Mississippi, and it actually that all black town becomes a safe haven 
for civil rights activists during the 1950s and 60s, during the height of some of the, the most violent moments of the civil rights movement. So you can see how this kind of cooperative all black town becomes as a kind of refuge, a safe haven for activists over time. Okay. Um, so just now moving into the 20th century where I am more comfortable in my historical argument, uh, cooperatives continue to be absolutely central to black history into the early 20th century. One of the most important proponents of cooperatives in this period of the early 20th century is W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, when Du Bois was at Atlanta University, he helped to co-author this 1907 publication, Economic Cooperation, uh, among Negro Americans to both study the Black cooperatives that have been founded throughout the South in the post-emancipation period, and also importantly, to make an argument for spreading those cooperatives outside of the South. He says, quote, in the study, we unwittingly stand at the crossroads. Should we go the way of capitalism and try to become individually rich as capitalists? Or should we go the way of cooperatives and economic cooperation where we and our whole community could be rich together. So in 1918, W.E.B. Du Bois founds the Negro Cooperative Guild, which is a national organization. And he actually travels the country and does it in more writing, trying to promote cooperatives, particularly as you have a mass migration of African-Americans outside of the South into Northern and Midwestern cities. So he's trying to also migrate the cooperatives out across the country. And he has some success doing so. Uh, the other photograph here is of the activist Ella Baker, one of the most important civil rights activists of the 20th century, who some of you may have heard of from her work in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or with Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, organization, the SCLC. She also was a secretary for the NAACP. But when she was a young woman, her first activist job was the promotion of cooperatives. So she was hired to run the Young Negroes Cooperative League in 1930. Um, she attended a cooperative institute at Brookwood Labor College, which I write about extensively in my new book, actually, and was part of this workers' education movement. So here, too, you can see a direct tie between the cooperative movement and the broader civil rights movement. So now I'm going to move into the 1930s and the Great Depression, and I'm going to focus here um, for the for this sort of bulk of the talk on two different examples um, of mass cooperative utopian movements uh, during the Great Depression into the 1940s that were particularly successful. And I wanna focus most particularly, um, I just go back there, most particularly on the Father Divine movement. Again, if you're a student of utopian communities, you might have some knowledge or pre-knowledge of the Father Divine movement, but many people actually, uh, are, you know, this has largely disappeared often from historical memory. Now, I need to point out in terms of context that the Great Depression was a period of a real heightened interest in cooperatives for African Americans because of the dire economic straits that people were in uh, during that period. And creating cooperatives and cooperative, cooperative communities was a way to create kind of communities where you could pool your resources and work outside of the capitalist system. And actually that first quote in the very beginning of the talk comes from this period. I'll give you another. Um, this is from Althea Washington, who also worked on this, this movement. And she says in 1939, quote, the cooperative movement is based on the deep and abiding religious principles of honesty, justice, equality, brotherhood, and love. The cooperative movement is interfaith, interclass, and interrace. Therefore, it gives us that common meeting ground, which produces the best setting for working together. So again, it's a broader sense of cooperative. It's about brotherhood. It's about nonviolence in many cases, right? It's about religion. It's about interracial understanding. So it's a more sort of utopian sense of cooperatives. The most successful utopian community, I would argue, in the 20th century, and certainly cooperative community in the 20th century, was the Father Divine Movement whose peace mission built an economic empire in Harlem and elsewhere, as I'll describe in the 1930s and 40s, with hundreds of cooperative businesses from gas stations to boarding houses uh, to retail stores and so forth. Um, and let me just give you a little bit of just some super brief background uh, on Father Divine. 
and his biography. He was uh, born in the 1890s. We don't know exactly what date he was born. He was born outside of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and he spent his early life in Baltimore and also traveling around the country as an itinerant preacher. Um, in the late 19 teens, he moves to Brooklyn and there he begins to develop his communal utopian uh, society, which he calls the Peace Mission. Um, and it's an, from the very beginning, it's an actually an interracial society. Uh, he then purchases a major property in Long Island and Sayville, Long Island. Uh, this is by 1920, but his movement really takes off in the 1930s, again, partly during the Great Depression. And I should emphasize here that Father Devine uh, preached that there was no such thing as race, and he also downplayed categories of gender um, in his teaching. So he says that he quite literally does not see race, right, and he's creating this interracial utopia, utopian heaven uh, here on earth. Uh, just a, a couple things about his practices. Um, he, Divine's followers tended to change their name and they really talked about really recreating themselves entirely within this community. There was uh, no alcohol, there was no tobacco. You can see this international modest code established by uh, Father Divine, no smoking, no drinking, no obscenity. Uh, no undue mixing of the sexes. He preached also celibacy, which he took directly from Anne Lee's teaching and the Shakers. Um, and I should say he was influenced by other earlier utopian communities as well. Now this might not sound like, like much fun with the no drinking and no profanity, but actually Father Divine's communities, his extensions as he called them, the peace missions were filled with music. They were filled with dancing. They were filled with abundant food as I'll show you in just a moment. So this is, you know, it's, it's a much more kind of joyous um, sort of celebration, celebratory uh, utopian community in many ways. I should also say, and I'm not going to go into detail, although I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A, uh, that unlike the sort of label of utopian communities being separate from the broader society or isolated from the broader society, the Father Divine Movement was deeply engaged in politics and particularly civil rights during the 30s and 40s and even, even beyond. So he advocated for the anti-lynching bill. Um, he had mass marches in Harlem in support of civil rights causes. So he was, you know, again, deeply engaged in what was happening politically during his time. So the Father Divine Movement might be most well known for their communal banquets, which are really fascinating. And this is what really drew people in, as you might imagine, during the Great Depression, when there's obviously problems of scarcity of food, um, and people are unemployed and in some cases actually going hungry. These communal banquets were free um, and you did not, you actually were forbidden from actually donating anything to the uh, peace mission when you went to these banquets. Um, and you can see that people are actually lining up. Actually, I have another image here. You can see people are lining up to be served the food um, at the banquets. They would serve one set of people and then they would get up and leave. And then another set would sit down and eat after them. Just to give you a little bit of a description here, Father Divide would usually be uh, at the top of the table and he would also be giving some, some preaching, some sermons as people were eating. Uh, the first courses tended to be vegetables, um, often a dozen courses past family style. Then came platters of meat, both cold cuts such as ham and hot roast beef, fried chicken and roasted fowl. There were salads and breads followed by an assortment of desserts. Iced and hot coffee and tea accompanied the meal that was often served by Father Divine himself. And again, he gave sort of testimony as people um, were actually eating this food. So this is sort of a reflective of some of his religious teachings, which again, I'm happy to talk more about. Prosperity gospel, for example, um, and particularly the 19th century um, ideals around new thought religion very much inform him, his, uh, his religious teachings here and his practices. But while other forms, like many other New Thought religious leaders actually focused on things like fasting, Father Divine preached feasting during the Great Depression. And again, it kind of reflected the abundance of God, what he would provide for you, what Father Divine would provide for you as well. So I wanna shift now to his uh, cooperatives. <clears throat> and again, this is by far the most successive, successful set of cooperative businesses that you see uh, in the 20th century. By the mid 1930s, the Peace Mission was among the largest realty holder in Harlem. They had three apartment houses, um, other private houses as well. 
15 to 20 apartments and meeting halls, 25 restaurants, six groceries, 10 barber shops, 10 cleaning stores, 24 wagons, and a coal business. Um, so very prosperous. And then you have other businesses, which I'll show you some images of outside of Harlem as well. So how did this happen? How did they create this uh, amount of wealth? Well, one thing they did is they charge low prices, below market prices that people could actually afford. So they would actually go and make use of these businesses. Um, as some of you may know about utopian communities, living in a communal situation is actually quite economic, right? So they don't involve private housing, they're living communally. Um, they're sharing resources, they're purchasing their supplies for wholesale prices. They're not spending money on things like alcohol, which brings the, uh, the um, amount of money they're spending overall down as well. They use an entirely cash economy. They do not take out any loans. So one of the ways they can buy a lot of this land and businesses during this period is they literally are showing up with bags of cash, like, like suitcases of cash, right, to buy these properties. Um, and again, during the Great Depression, that would be very attractive to somebody who is trying to sell a property or sell land. Uh, so I wanna talk now about something called the promised land, um, which is a really remarkable set of cooperatives and a, really a utopian community in and of itself. This is an agricultural area. This is in Ulster County, New York. It's about a hundred miles north on the Hudson River um, from Harlem. And I should point out that Father Divine chose this community well, for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons was because it was a predominantly, if not completely white community. Um, he does that in Long Island and in New Jersey as well, because he believes in racial equality. He believes in desegregation. So through his spread of his cooperative empire, he is also engaged in a practice of desegregation and of integration um, of these communities. He brought his uh, first farm in 1935. You can see here on the chart, the list of the various farms. Uh, thousands became joint owners in these cooperative communities. Most of these communities were actually run by black women. Many of them, particularly the agricultural communities uh, were, were uh, they, they used the skills of these black women, often migrants from the South who knew how to raise vegetables, who knew how to raise livestock. And that food, talk about farm to table, that food goes to those communal banquets, right? So it goes to those communal banquets and it also goes to the low cost uh, cooperative restaurants that Father Divine and the Peace Mission run um, around the country. Uh, so it really is a kind of black women's movement. Other historians have pointed this out. So in total, there's about 30 communities with 2,300 people living in them. Um, and the last one was sold in 1985. So they do last for a while after the, the post, in, into the post-war period. They also included some gas stations and hotels. Um, there's a little industrial village that actually gets set up. Uh, and one of them, Crumb Elbow, was actually across the river, directly across the river from Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, Hyde Park. So you could go to Crumb Elbow and in, in picnic and and celebrate with the Father Divine community and literally go and look at Hyde Park, the president's house right across the river. So that has a, a certain kind of import. Just a couple of images here. Uh, these are some of the more business communities of cooperatives. You can see the grocery store, um, the gas station, et cetera, Father Divine there. This I believe is Crumb Elbow. Um, and you can see people here picnicking. And then finally, this is a lot of what was going on uh, was also a kind of resort economy. So think about the 30s, and again, this lasts into the past, the 30s as well, where African-Americans have little access to recreation, to resorts, subject of my last book. Uh, and so these integrated resort communities allow black Americans to go places where they can swim, where they can dance, for very, very little money and really enjoy themselves. So this is wildly popular, certainly in Harlem. So you can see here the, uh, the flyer, it's, it's inexpensive, it's free for children. Um, and this is something that's accessible to a lot of people. And I should say that this got a lot of attention. There was newsreels about how successful the Father Divine movement was. And let me just read from the New York Times. Um, this is from 1939, New York Times article about promised land. So the New York Times says, quote, in this huge community that has facilities for feeding and lodging perhaps 10,000 persons at one time, where no person may smoke, drink, or curse, 
There are cultivated farms, resort hotels, country clubs, estates, scores of houses and dormitories, all manner of restaurants, stores, gasoline stations, tailor shops, barber shops, garages, and even two large docks with boat houses on the Hudson River capable of accommodating the largest excursion steamers. Uh, so again, gathers, it, it attracts a lot of attention and because and becomes really enormously um, successful. So the Father Divine sort of utopian politics touch many thousands of black and white members in ways that other black leaders could only dream of. Uh, as one participant, Sarah Harris said, quote, Father Divine's Negro followers get more immediate satisfaction from the way their leader attacks discriminatory patterns than the followers of more down to earth Negro leaders can ever get from there. And I think that immediacy, which is what you see in kind of prefigurative politics is really, is really essential. Uh, it is difficult to evaluate the impact of this political work, although the economic value of divine cooperatives and the food and lodging provided are evident, but the ability to go to these resorts, to travel to places with pools and beaches for black Americans was certainly a profound expression of freedom. So I wanna shift now, uh, and, I, and again, question and answer, I'm happy to talk more about this movement, but I actually wanna to shift to one other example um, before I talk a little bit about the broader project just briefly. And the other example I want to point to in terms of the impact of Rochdale and Owenite cooperative ideas, 19th century ideas, which Father Divine was very engaged with and talked about in his sermons um, and in his writing, uh, is also found in a really fascinating uh, utopian experiment also in Mississippi, which was the Delta Cooperative Farm. And I should say there's a second farm called the Providence uh, Cooperative Farm that this expands into. So this was founded in 1936. Uh, Sherwood Eddy, who was white, a white Protestant missionary um, who really traveled the world and, and was fascinated with the idea of cooperatives with other utopian communities, Protestant liberal, he travels to Arkansas in the mid 30s to investigate the plight of sharecroppers who were being evicted wholesale from um, their land or the land of the landowners, the land that they had been farming during the Great Depression, partly because of some of the New Deal policies involving agriculture um, and also because of the repression of these landowners. Uh, and he was engaged in a in a in a uh, a struggle to actually try to unionize and organize these displaced sharecroppers. This is called the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. Um, and the Southern Tenant Farmer Union members were often, again, thrown off of their land uh, and attacked by white supremacists throughout the South. So Sherwood Eddy decides that with the aid of a network of pacifists, um, that he would purchase land in rural Mississippi and create an interracial cooperative farm where these black and white sharecroppers who had this common experience could come together to live interracially and to create some cooperative wealth, hopefully on this farm. And let me just quote Sherwood Eddy here, who says, we emphatically believe that cooperation by itself is not enough to establish a new order, argued Eddy, but it may be one important nonviolent method by which we may pass from an old outworn order to something new and better. So again, very much resonating with Robert Owen, very much resonating with some of the other quotes I've provided today. So co cooperation and isolation isn't enough, but it's a way towards this new vision of a new society. Um, I have one more, this is actually the image that's on the cover of my new book, which you'll see in just a minute. Uh, and these, I should say, these photographs are taken by Dor Dorothea Lang during the New Deal when she worked for the great photographer, when she worked for the Farm Security Administration. Now, interesting, at the Delta Cooperative Farm, which for a time was quite successful, especially in the early years, they actually called their post office um, and their community center Rochdale. So it was basically known through the community as Rochdale, again, because they're following the Rochdale principles uh, from the 19th century. So cooperation across racial lines um, and against a corrupt agricultural system fueled this utopian experiment it was finally taken down in the 50s around the time of the Emmett Till murder as a result of white supremacists who uh, repeatedly attacked, particularly the Providence Cooperative Farm and forced them to shut down and to distribute the land. So that was part of the kind of 1950s backlash that you see in places like Mississippi. 
Uh, it also becomes a favorite spot for particularly Christian socialists and utopian socialists to visit. So they have a lot of visitors coming through the Delta and Providence Cooperative Farms and who are then replicating or other kinds of these communities and experiments um, elsewhere in the country. So that becomes important as well. Um, I should also say that, that the Delta Cooperative Farm was an important model for New Deal administrators. So the Farm Security Administration created large scale cooperative communities in a similar model. However, the very important difference is that the FSA, FSSA cooperative communities uh, were largely segregated. There's a couple that involve a few African-Americans, but there's largely all white or all black uh, cooperative communities in terms of the New Deal community. But it is an example of how utopian community planning, which we see over and over again in utopian history, can influence government and private planning of well pri private development. Uh, just to go back to Sherwood Eddy, Sherwood Eddy liked to talk about how much better his cooperative farm, the Delta Cooperative Farm was than the New Deal cooperative communities. And he says, quote, could the government, for instance, under a confessedly capitalist economy, promote such a cooperative movement as frankly we are doing? Could it officially uphold the Southern Tenant Farmers Union or any other similar organization? Could it officially organize interracial cooperation with the object of giving equal economic justice to both races? Or with the complete separation of church and state to which it's, it is committed, could it apply the principles of realistic religion as a social dynamic? Um, and I should say religion was central at the Delta Cooperative Farm, a kind of prophetic religion, both from the African-American tradition and from liberal theologians like people like Sherwood Eddy. So he's saying there too, that you need religion in a sense to actually make this work, to make this happen, which is a kind of interesting contrast. Um, I would also argue for the legacy of cooperatives in Mississippi all the way through today. Uh, and so if you think about the sort of mass civil rights movement of the 1960s, you have, for example, the legacy of Freedom Summer, in 1964, where you have black and white activists who stream into Mississippi and they create freedom schools, they register people to vote, right? They engage in um, an enormous amount of activism, activism. But actually there was freedom summer-like activity in the late 1930s and 1940s at these cooperative farms where white college students from the North were going down to Delta and Providence cooperative farms and they were actually engaging not only in agricultural labor, which they were doing, um, but also in civil rights organizing and, and public health kind of campaigns and literacy campaigns. So there is a direct kind of connection um, there as well. Uh, activists also coordinated more, a more series of ventures into the mid 1960s. The successor to the FSA, which I've already mentioned, which is the Farmers Home Administration, funded the startup costs for a group of black farmers in Panola County, Mississippi, to purchase land and equipment and develop a successful cooperative there. Uh, in a similar venture, an African-American activist from Boston, Owen Brooks, worked to develop the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative, which actually housed 900 families producing food for themselves and the market. This is also in the late 60s. The legendary Mississippi activist, Fannie Lou Hamer, also built a cooperative in the 1970s that she named Freedom Farm, which included a pig bank that poor families could use to begin to, begin to raise their own livestock. In 1966, another civil rights legend, John Lewis, who unfortunately recently passed away, began to work with the Southern Regional Council's community organizing project to run cooperatives. And this lasts until today. Today, the Mississippi uh, Association of Cooperatives which is part of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. You can see the FSC up there is the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Uh, the LAF is the Land Assistance Fund. Um, this is thriving today. It includes 10 cooperatives with a largely black membership. Uh, they have, of course, interracial understanding, but it's largely helping uh, black farmers in these cooperatives. And they explicitly say that they're building from a tradition steeped in the civil rights movement. Uh, I also want to just quickly mention a Black nationalist kind of piece of this, which is something I don't explore as much in my own work, but know a fair amount, so I, I can certainly happy to answer questions, but also connected to history of cooperatives in Mississippi. There was a Black nationalist organization or Black power organization in the 70s established in Detroit, actually, called the Republic of New Africa. 
1970, they go down to Mississippi and they try to establish a kind of cooperative utopian community there. That ends up failing, but one of the members of that sort of initial organization, Chakwi Lumbamba, was elected in 2013, so relatively recently, as mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, and helped to spear a really fascinating project known as Cooperation Jackson. You can see the icon there. Uh, under Lubamba's leadership, the citizens of Jackson engage in participatory democracy to determine the city's budget and priorities, and very cognizant of the long history of Black cooperatives, which of course date back to the 19th century, and remember Mount Bayou is also in Mississippi, they launched a series of cooperatives that include agriculture, commerce, and arts and culture. Um, and they also have a community land trust, which is uh, for cooperative housing development. So you can see the spirit of cooperatives is alive and well in Mississippi up to um, the present day. And there's some other sort of newer utopian black nationalist communities that are being founded in the South um, as well. So from the English Rochdale Weavers to Rochdale, Mississippi, cooperation has long been an essential tool in the long civil rights movement and in the labor movement. And I want to now talk a little bit about my book. Um, this is coming out from the University of Chicago Press, probably in February, and you can pre-order it uh, on the University of Chicago Press website if, if you so want to. Um, but I'll just to kind of give you a little bit of context of where this history is coming out of in my own work. So living in the future, the utopian, um, utopianism and the long civil rights movement, I changed the title just slightly, uh, examines how utopian ideas and practices shape civil rights. And I basically look at communities that have four things in common, which is the case of the Father Divine Movement and the Delta Cooperative Farm, as well as some other things. So the first thing is prefigurative politics, something that Robert Owen certainly practiced. Um, and prefigurative politics is a term that was coined in 1977 by the political scientist Carl Boggs, who wrote, quote, by prefigurative, I mean the embodiment within the ongoing political practice of a movement of those forms of social relations, decision-making, culture, and human experience that are the ultimate goal. So it's basically an emphasis on the means rather than the ends, right? It's the whole idea of living in the future. You, you, you literally embody the community that you want to create. That's what they did in New Harmony. It's the, what they did in the Delta Cooperative Farm. It's what they did in the Promised Land. So that's sort of one category kind of guiding light uh, for the work that I do. Um, the second one is nonviolence and the things that I, the communities that I'm looking at specifically practice a kind of Gandhian form of nonviolent direct action. Um, and that includes, I should say, the Father Divine movement. They did a uh, nonviolent direct action borrowing from Gandhi's practices as early as the late 30s and early 1940s. So they were actually doing sit-ins um, and engaging in that kind of nonviolent practices, which again, something that people often don't know about the Father Divine movement. Some of the other groups I look at, like the Congress of Racial Equality, are better well known as, as people who are or activists who are developing um, nonviolent direct action. The Highlander Folk School is another um, community that I look at in this book, similarly focused on nonviolence. Uh, interracialism, you could write an entire book about Black nationalists uh, and Black only towns, for example, um, and, and write much of the same sort of history. My own work look at, looks at interracial communities and particularly the kind of concept of brotherhood, um, the cooperative concept of brotherhood that are absolutely central to Father Divine. Um, and again, some of these other examples. And then finally, what I've spent this entire talk talking about, which is the idea of cooperatives, not just as an economic strategy, but rather as a broader kind of socialist, utopian socialist strategy to rethink society uh, much more broadly. So that again, it's the book project, and I'm going to wind it up here um, so we have some time for a discussion as well with this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. All the great turning points of history have been made by small determined groups, which suggests a certain import of utopianism. And I should say that there's something of a resurgence of interest, I would argue, in utopian thought today, um, and particularly in a kind of social unionism and utopian socialism that really reminds me of some of the 19th century utopian uh, experimentation in places like New Harmony, as well as the civil rights unionism of the 1930s. 
So there's been a resurgence of interest in black cooperatives and uh, uh, cooperatives more generally, um, including in rural black communities. Um, there's also a kind of resurgence of interest in some black nationalist projects. If you think about things like Afrofuturism, for example, also visionary political movements that are very prefigurative. Angela Davis's call for prison abolition, abolition uh, the call for a new green deal, again, a sort of utopian strain throughout those political movements. And as MLK suggests, King suggests in this quote, social experimentation by small groups can create revolutionary change. Uh, and I think that we can agree that the reach of Robert Owen, of Rochdale and the New Harmonists have been long and powerful in this history of civil rights. So that is where I will end. I'm gonna stop the share there. Okay. Uh, well, well, thank you, Dr. Walcott. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, I learned a lot, it was very exciting. Um, and then we do have one question and then I have a question. And of course, um, for all of, all of you still with us, um, if you have questions, feel free to share them in the chat as well. Okay, this is a great question about the Nation of Islam. So thank you very much for asking it. Um, and there are other actual religious groups in that interwar period, um, the Moorish Science Temple, um, there's some black Jewish groups too, uh, which sort of parallel the Father Divine movement. Um, so there are, so there are relationships here uh, so 1933, um, Elijah Pohl goes to the city of Detroit, right, um, and begins to travel through the city of Detroit and talk about this new movement of the Nation of Islam. And one of the things that he preaches to in, in, in Detroit is the importance of cooperative economics. Um, and of course, there's a legacy of that also with the Garvey movement starting in the 1920s, you know, Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, United Negro Improvement Association, uh, they also started cooperatives. So there's a kind of black nationalist um, and black religious nationalist strain of, of cooperation uh, in this history um, as well. So I think there is really a direct connection there. And of course, the NOI continues to have these businesses. So economic nationalism um, often is run on a cooperative basis. Not always. Sometimes the economic nationalism is more about kind of, you know, small capitalist entrepreneurs. Uh, you see some of that as well. Um, but often these are run as cooperatives and it's, it's just economically more efficient to do so as well. So that's, that's a really good question. Uh, I have a question. And, and of course, again, if you, if anyone else out there has one, please share in the chat, you know, and I, you touched on this in, in the beginning, but kind of Robert Owen's views and relationship with slavery um, and African-Americans is kind of, you know, mixed, whereas his views would typically you would think that he would be um, considered a, a staunch abolitionist, as you said. He did profit off of off of slavery with the cotton in New Anarchs Mills. But I and I was trying to find the wording while you were um, while you were speaking. Mm -hmm. But he does say, and when it comes to New Harmony, that persons of color are not um, allowed, which I found very interesting, considering how kind of Fanny Wright, who of course took a lot of um, inspiration from from New Harmony, as well as his own son, Robert Dale, kind of really swung completely the other way and, and really went towards that abolish, abolitionist movement. Yeah. So I guess my question is, when Robert Owens considered one of the founders of kind of that cooperative movement, and you're talking about all of these African American communities that kind of um, subscribed to his um, ideals, I guess, was there any kind of um, hesitancy from these black cooperative movements to follow Robert Owen's ideas and and kind of his his written instructions, so to speak, to form cooperative? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there's a pragmatism there, right? So um, in addition to Robert Owen, another hugely influential um, sort of utopian thinker of the 19th century, um, that whose, whose kind of work was followed was Edward Bellamy, who wrote the famous utopian novel, Looking Backward. This is later in the 19th century. Bellamy's ideas about race are, are not great either. <laughs> um, uh, so there is a certain pragmatism um, in terms of these all black towns with the Rochdale principles, um, with these ideals. So they understand that many of these utopian communities were essentially all white utopian communities. The Shakers are, are a little bit different because it, they actually did do some outreach um, in these sort of border states and so forth. So I haven't run across um, much hand wringing about that um, in the work that I've done. I think, again, it's around pragmatism, it's around taking these ideas, it's around kind of applying these ideas. 
Uh, I don't know enough about, about Robert Dale Owen. I would love to know more. And I could obviously I could do some more research or read more um, to think about why he became such a staunch and important abolitionist, uh, given the sort of the context of, of the kind of racial homogeneity um, of New Harmony. I know for some founders of utopian communities, they focused on, uh, they, there was a sort of belief that people had to be alike enough that they could get along. Um, that they, you could only have a kind of transformation of human nature without conflict. Um, and so even in the early 20th century, like the, the California socialist communities like New Llano or Llano del Rio, it later becomes New Llano when they moved to Louisiana, they, they did not allow African-Americans, even when they're in California, outside of Los Angeles, right? This is in you know, the 19 teens. Um, they were very explicit not to allow African-Americans. And then in Louisiana, they didn't either. There they said it was because of the racial laws of the state. Um, but meanwhile, like Highlander, you know, was already um, interracial. So, so it, it kind of continues on, in, unfortunately, into the 20th century. And then even if you think about the 1970s um, hippie communes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, ethnographers and sociologists who study those communes, they're essentially all white. They didn't necessarily have explicit instructions, right, about um, not being interracial, uh, but they, they were essentially, you know, homogeneous in that, in that way. So, Unfortunately, that is also the legacy. And that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in interracialism, because it means it's a, there's a certain utopian optimism and um, immediacy to interracialism, which I find fascinating. Thanks. Uh, this is question is from John Grace. Um, was there any interaction of the utopian cooperatives uh, with James Baldwin? Huh. They certainly would have particularly the more intellectual um, groups that I look at. So one of the groups I look at in the book are the fellowship houses and fellowship churches. Um, I look at a, a very important uh, theologian, uh, Howard Thurman, the first African-American to meet with Gandhi in, in India, actually, and to bring Gandhian ideas to the United States. So somebody like Howard Thurman would have likely even known James Baldwin. They, they may have been some sort of you know, interaction there. Um, but other than that, that, so this, that sort of more, slightly more educated elite kind of liberal uh, utopian thinkers may have. I think the Father Divine, James Baldwin obviously knew who Father Divine was, but whether he would have had interaction, um, I'm not entirely sure uh, if that's the case. That's an interesting idea though. Um, and then can you speak a little more maybe about the, link the linkage between religion and cooperative communities? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Robert Owen was uh, sort of famously not so religious. <laughs> um, and in fact, that, that first quote I give, I know that society may be formed, et cetera, et cetera. He starts off that actually by talking about um, not believing in the millennium, right? So millennialism is the driving force behind uh, Christian perfectionism, uh, really starting in the 17th century, um, but really the 18th and 19th century, so that most of the early utopian communities in the 18th and 19th century, I'm thinking about places like Ephrata, for example, uh, were Christian perfectionist um, millennial communities. So one of the things that's sort of fascinating about New Harmony and about Robert Owen, unlike the Raphaites, for example, from who he purchased the property from, uh, is that, that, they stay, that they're more secular and they develop the, these communities without that drive of Christian perfectionism um, leading, leading the life of the early Christians essentially here on earth. Uh, so, so that's, that makes them stand out. Um, when it comes to the Father Divine movement, it's a fascinating kind of syncretic combination of elements of Catholicism, including the celibacy piece of it, um, some of the rituals of Catholicism with some of the new thought think, the religious thinking of the 19th century, which leads most famously to Christian scientists. So they believe Father Divine believed in faith healing uh, he believed that he had the ability to heal people. Um, he believed that people had the ability to heal themselves. So there's like an element of that in there as well, uh, along with, you know, Pentecostalism and kind of, and, and Protestant evangelicalism all kind of combined together. So that's absolutely central. For uh, liberal theologians like Sherwood Eddy, you know, they believe in this kind of prophetic uh, Protestant tradition. Um, and that becomes very, very important for the development of their communities. Uh, the Catholic worker movement also develops their own kind of, um, in some ways, utopian communities. They have farming communes. 
they're less engaged in interracialism, although they're very, they're very open, certainly, to the civil rights movement. So it is very important. And often the communities that are most successful have a religious element, but that's not always the case. So Highlander folk school um, is, is much more secular, although there are individuals who are involved um, who were more religious. So, so it, it, sort of, it sort of varies, but religion can play an absolutely central role and has traditionally in American utopian history. Um, so I, actually more about religion, about the Father Divine being a prophet. So Father Divine's followers believed that he was God uh, and they called him God. Uh, he said that he was not, he's, you know, no, not, not definitely not God. Um, but he saw himself as very similar to Anne Lee uh, of the Shakers. He compared himself to Anne Lee. Um, he talked about Anne Lee's spirit talking to him actually. Uh, so it's sort of similar in that way. So yes, I mean, he, he definitely claimed to be, you know, a prophetic voice. Um, of a kind of Christian perfectionist God who was neither male nor female. So he really emphasized the, that God does not have a gender, is neither male nor female, certainly neither black nor white. Um, so he did, he did claim that kind of divinity, essentially. And as so often happens with these kind of religious charismatic leaders, um, he also believed that he may very well be immortal. And so, of course, when he dies, that leads to a, a bit of a crisis uh, within the community, although it does continue on um, after his death. I think he dies in 63, I'm pretty sure, 1963. So, yeah. All right. Well, that looks to be um, the end of our questions. Again, Dr. Walcott, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. We're so glad you were able to join us. No problem. Thank you all uh, for just coming. Have a quick rack. Sure. And then let me do this quick wrap up. Hold on, my computer's being difficult. Give me a second. It's been giving me problems all evening. There we go. Uh, again, thank you. I just wanted to give you guys a bit of a preview on um, kind of what we have coming up in relation to our program. Uh, Waterways, which is a Smithsonian traveling exhibit um, that dives into water, an essential component of li life on our planet, environmentally, culturally, and historically, will be on display at the Athenaeum starting October 2nd for six weeks, ending on October 14th. And in conjunction with that, we have several programs uh, that will be available uh, to the public, including a kayak trip down the Wabash, mm -hmm. a documentary um, showing with the producer, and um, another conversation or a conversation with um, a representative, uh, Cassie Hoswald from the Nature Conservancy. So to find more information about that, please visit usi.edu forward slash waterways. The next conversation as a part of our Robert Owen Turner 50th celebration is Dr. Matthew Roberts, and he will uh, present Robert Owen, Harmonic Passions and the Practice of Happiness. He is an associate professor in modern British history at Sheffield Hallam University in the United Kingdom. So we're very happy that he, he will be able to join us. Uh, that presentation will be um, at 1 p.m. on October 12th. Because he is in the UK, we have to be a little bit earlier, so it's not midnight over there. Uh, but we hope you'll be there uh, as well. And finally, please stay connected with us. Um, anything you might need to know about Historic New Harmony, you can find it at www.usi.edu forward slash h uh, Follow us on social media as well. We're very active on Facebook and Instagram. And then of course we do have a monthly e-newsletter. Uh, we've we restarted it last year and it's been going for uh, over a year now. And that's a great way to kind of keep up with what's going on, um, not only in New Harmony uh, in the town, but also with uh, Historic New Harmony as well. And you can find that newsletter at usi.edu forward slash in harmony. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation as much as we as much as I did. Um, I hope to see you again. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Walcott. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>